Thank you, Thomas. A great oversight of many of the themes that will be discussed on the panels and in the uh, talks today. Um, so we now move on to the first panel of the day, looking at the use cases um, and business cases for blockchain and DLT technologies in the capital markets. Uh, peak blockchain hype was reached in the mid 2010s, but since then a quiet revolution has been underway as real life cases has developed and built out. Breakout from DLT's role as the ledger for digital assets and securities is ine inevitable, but there are many challenges on the way. With me today to discuss this is Jens Hatschmeister, Managing Director of Issuer Services and New Digital Markets at Deutsche Börse, Benjamin Duve, Digital as our Director of Digital Assets and Blockchain at BMY Mellon, and Amar Amlani, Executive Director of Digital Assets at Goldman Sachs. A gentleman, welcome. Uh, ben, I want, to, I want to begin with you. As I, as I mentioned, peak blockchain, we saw the hype in 2010 and then soon after the inevitable uh, crash and uh, realisation that it wasn't all immediately around the corner. Um, but how much progress have we made, made and where is the industry in terms of DLT today? Thank you for the question. Well, first, let me thank Eurex for the invite. It's a yearly event now. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And getting back to your question, I think there are three components to that. The first component is we see crypto with Bitcoin and Ether as a new asset class emerging, at least from our client's uh, perspective. And we as BNY Mellon will offer a solution to safe keep those in a resilient and compliant manner for our clients in the US um, in the very near future. And there is a second component to it, and I think it was alluded to before, there is a whole sphere of new uh, investment opportunities around funds and we as BNY Mellon as a, we are a trusted um, uh, partner for our, our customers are helping them on their journey and offering those services in the fund space. This is one area we are talking to but being here in this panel and, and speaking with, with Jens and, and uh, Amar I think the different, uh, the, the second part of this puzzle is more interesting, digital assets, not as crypto, but presenting a little more traditional assets we are used to. And I think there we see two components. We see that unregulated world, which really has come about with a lot of innovation. But then we see the regulated world, I think where, it's where we all sit in, with, I have to be honest, limited progress, at least at first glance. I mean, we've seen a lot of POCs. I was in a different company also before where we did a few things with, with you guys. Um, but from that on, not much has changed, but I think behind the scenes, a lot has changed. We are early on in the innovation curve of, uh, of the asset class itself, but also we had to, I think, as an industry, first realize what are the opportunity, true opportunities around DLT, and then how to make that work with the current financial infrastructure we have, and where do we really gain and benefit, and how do we deploy that technology? And I think um, a nice word uh, was said before, how can we use best of both, world, both worlds? And I think without giving too much away, I think everybody um, is working on something and I think there will be those first solutions and ideas coming to the market quite soon. And Will, if, if, I, if I may add, um, I think uh, or I sometimes feel that uh, a DLT and blockchain as a technology is a bit overhyped. So compare it to the internet. I mean, uh, uh, just uh, yesterday I read an article that 80% of the internet um, um, capacity is used for streaming. Now going back to the mid 90s, then no one was talking about streaming. So I believe that we are still early in the play to really um, uh, kind of unfold and understand the different um, opportunities and possibilities we have with this technology. And um, I think uh, uh, Ben rightfully said, I think there are, there are, there are multiple ways to, to use the technology, be it on the uh, broadening the, the, the asset universe, yeah, which is uh, a Bitcoin or the uh, alternative asset classes to be digitized, and then the then then the market efficiency uh, play really. And I believe that in both angles, we are not we, we have only seen uh, uh, the beginning of what what will be possible. And uh, uh, Thomas uh, rightfully said, in my view, uh, regulation 
uh, and the 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 availability of sound regulation is for me the foundation of all of all solutions we see in regulated markets because in order to invest be it for us as a financial market infrastructure for uh, market participants like Boney, like probably Goldman, we need this kind of regular, uh, regulated frame under which we then can invest in infrastructure and market solution. And last but not least, the last thought in my view, um, you can talk about regulation, you can talk about technology as an enabler, but finally to me, you need to find the, um, the hook where, uh, where value is created. So, and value creation always is is uh, is defined and perceived by the client. So, really, we come we come from the probably from the from the from the client perspective to what is the perceived value. Not talking of, uh, about, for example, efficiency. Then it is: are things faster? Are they cheaper? Are they more reliable? Um, talking about asset classes: are access to asset class uh, uh, quicker, less costly, transfer of digital assets uh, uh, cheaper than in the in the real world? So there need to be this edge in order to drive solutions and drive demand. And then, based on technology and regulation, you can talk about solution. And I think we are we are we are just starting. Interesting. I mean, if we perhaps start with some of the basics, that was a great, I think, scene setting of where we are. But in terms of technology itself, what does it actually do? What are the major benefits it brings to capital markets? Yeah, no, really good question. And hi, everyone, and thanks to be dialing in uh, today. I think, I guess when we look at what the technology actually brings, I like to think about it in, in two ways. What are the properties of, of distributed ledger technology? Now, the first is a single source of truth, which is immutable, distributed, cannot be altered by, by any party. And the second way I, I like to think about things is a new set of rails, you know, a new set of rails on which cash and collateral can move. Now, if we just take the first one, that single source of truth, the benefits I see it bringing are really reducing the need for reconciliations and reducing a lot of the post-trade pain that I think we see in the industry today. You know, at the moment, you have institutions managing their own books and records and, you know, T plus one, two, three, after something's been executed, things are still going back and forth to check. Did we agree? Did we match, et cetera? That all goes away. Uh, with the new technology so really an operational efficiency um, but the other piece the new set of rails i think this is where you really begin to broaden away from operational efficiencies to reducing risk you know a new set of rails where a cash token and a collateral token exchange simultaneously and one cannot move without the other that's transformative from a re reduction in liquidity risk credit risk capital um, as well the other piece you get is removing um, a single point of failure so again if you think about this all the way through to the future, you know, different financial institutions or, or even corporates hosting nodes on a blockchain, you can now actually take that peer-to-peer -peer trading component we often hear about and we see in the cryptocurrency space and apply it to wholesale financial markets as well. And again, that really begins to reduce, you know, again, it, it really does come down to an operational efficiency, a reduction in risk um, as well. So those those are sort of the two the two main ways I think about things. Interesting. And I think that's, we'll that's where your initial question came from, right? Why didn't we see a lot of things? Those are all great things. And then a lot of people came around and say, I have here a magic box. I open it and I have everything in this one platform. And you get all these things at once, just install it. And I think that's what doesn't work in a financial industry for regulatory reasons, for many other reasons uh, um, as well. And I think that's where we're moving towards. I think that's a very good I mean, you had that magic box, you open it, but it, you can't just plug and play it into the financial industry. Yeah. And absolutely. And, and I, I guess that's the, that's the point. It, it can do almost so much that it can do too much in some respects, and it's finding the right use cases. And we'll, we'll, we'll come on to what some of those are, but, but yeah, in terms of the considerations firms should have when considering DLT, what, what parameters do you look through when you evaluate whether a process is, is worth or is, is worthy of being run on a DLT basis? Yeah, uh, well, and, and let me, let me, let me uh, compliment to what, uh, what Ben has said and Amar at the same time. To me, if blockchain, and I probably it's, uh, it has uh, too often been, um, uh, being quoted, but if blockchain is the hammer, then per definition, not every problem is a nail. Yeah. So, meaning, um, uh, in 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 our view, and and Amar has talked about um, the kind of uh, single source of truth, the 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 value add of a distributed market infrastructure to very different parties, the idea to 
uh, to transform the um, financial instrument into something which is an object, make it smart, so a smart digital object. Uh, and finally, to model it from issuance to redemption by way of smart contracts, etc. These are some of the some of the considerations we would apply uh, when talking about um, a DLT solution. And then the big question is, um, sorry to say that, does it really need blockchain in any case? So the question is like, Blockchain, in our view, only adds the way uh, to uh, to kind of um, write transaction to the ledger in a way or in a, in a scenario or in a situation where you don't have a trusted third party. And given that we are talking about regulated market and regulation solution, in all fairness, into some problems, there are much more efficient solutions than a blockchain based um, um, processing of transaction to put it to put it very it's I know it's pro provocative here today, but in my view, it is always the question like what is the most efficient solution uh, uh, to the problem? But finally, if you take a step back, then still DLT and blockchain might be and probably is one of the key technologies in my view to take markets to the digital age really to move up from uh, the digitization of processes, uh, the digitization of functionalities in financial markets to the digitization of the core product of financial market, with it, which is uh, the financial instrument. And if this is the kind of driving force, the digitization of the financial instrument, it's modeling end to end from issuance to redemption, making it uh, a kind of auto asset service um, and smart digital object and share it as a single uh, single uh, source of truth with as many stakeholders in certain market segments as possible, then you can create the kind of um, market efficiency uh, you probably are aiming for. The sad thing about is uh, that usually these uh, these chains, they spend longer than current chains and they spend longer than one market participants in a uh, market participant in a certain context. So these are a bit um, some of the considerations we have. And keep, keeping that in mind for us, the, the question as a bank is always what is the benefit for clients, right? So I think just having DLT there as a solution, I, you go into a meeting, it's nice for press release, but in the end, people want to have their problem solved, right? And I think, I think Amar already pointed to a few topics we can address, but yeah, it might not be a pure DLT play, but it might be a combination. I mean, we all have legacy systems and clients. That's the funny thing is when you go to a client, they have legacy systems as well. Mm -hmm. So they want to interact with a DLT solution, reap benefits of a DLT solution without having to revamp tomorrow everything they have. I think it's a consideration and that's why I think it's such an evolutionary topic. You first have to see where you want to go. And I think that's where the industry is. I think we see this end-to-end -end, we have to as an industry see what's the end-to-end -end, how does it work how do the players play together how do the roles play together and i think then clients and 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 which for us are really uh, partners partly uh, uh, for centuries uh, as as i understand so um i think there it's very important for them to see that journey and then they're able to adjust their own also technological journey and i think the, the word you use is digital capital markets, right? It, 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 we need digital capital markets to reap benefits. And maybe some are not DLT, but you said it, so you get the, the uh, yeah. you get the comments <laughs> afterwards. And maybe I just them. quote, I just <laughs> quote, but maybe some are DLT based, maybe others are digital. Yeah. But I remember, I always make the joke, I thought when I drive here, I still hear the printers when I come into the building. That's done now, but maybe for a not too distant past that's actually the case right and if you think about that and how many fax machines i still um see and hear about here and there in in processes when we look at them it's astonishing and i think already that is a big gain right and so i think it's a think big but also adjust the journey and i think we have to go together clients infrastructure industry and i think that's very important in this yeah. and if you don't mind me adding just to, to the topic you both mentioned about Quite often, especially early on, it will seem that DLT isn't needed. And, and I say that because as these things start and you might have a network of two, three, four participants and, you know, people may not decide to run infrastructure themselves to begin with, they spit centralized. It is that odd period of centralized DLT and it probably emphasizes what both gentlemen just mentioned, which is that does do you really need DLT? And I think, you know, we're seeing that more and more and more. And I think the key is to think 
where is the medium term picture? Because I need to make sure I'm building on the right rails now to make sure I can actually unlock those medium term uh, benefits as well. Yeah. And and Will, if I may add one point, uh, at least from, from, from an infrastructure point of view, uh, people sometimes tend to forget that infrastructure needs to be loaded and uh, you need to have sufficient load on an infrastructure in order to make it profitable, profitable, not only for the provider of infrastructure, but as well for its users, because finally you want to drive down cost per unit. And so the question is like where to start. So it does not uh, work if you have an issuance here or there. So one issuance done, does not pay any infrastructure investments, not in incumbent infrastructure, nor in new infrastructure. Infrastructure. So therefore, it is really hard to find the use case. Give you an example, D7, we start with retail structured products. Uh, I think we are lucky in a way because this is 80% uh, of our active ISINs, uh, which we operate in Germany. So a good, a good, um, uh, a good magnitude. And at the same time, we see a high kind of turnover, up to 30,000 issuance a day, and up to uh, the kind of uh, two million reissued uh, over over the over a period of 12 months, which gives you enough flow to really test uh, digital pieces of infrastructure. And as a side note, these first pieces of D7 infrastructure are digital, but still central. And we'll add the, the D central part uh, in, a, in the next stage here. Yeah? So to our mass point, it's not all, it's and that, not that, all DLT. And that's where the partnership then the component comes in, right? Because we are global financial infrastructure, right? We help the capital markets globally to be orchestrated, but we can't be everything to everyone. We want to be the partner to our clients but we will need others to help us along the journey to connect um, a Goldman or have, uh, have a, a, a CSD part of the, the topic to give our clients the choices and the ability to use different options, right? But that's, that's what it's about. And I think, by the way, that's one of the problems for the, for the early days as well, right? Everybody thought they can build everything for everyone. Um, and I think that's, that's a very fresh thought. We always have... Uh, um, we want to build an open infrastructure for everybody to partake and, and join it and to really help, like we do today, facilitate and grease that capital markets uh, globally. Yeah, interesting. And um, Amal, in terms of the specific workflows and, and processes, uh, what progress? Where do you see the most progress? And I guess a related question is how will the how will that bigger picture capital markets evolution evolve based on what you see happening today? Yeah, so progress wise, I think I think as Jens mentioned at the beginning, you know that you've seen the proof of concepts taking place, and they're spanning multiple different types of uh, activity in capital markets. So you have proof of concepts, which are actually Actually, I'll caveat, a lot of these are actually moving to production now as well. I think we've gone through sort of the proof of concept type window, which is, you know, 20, 20, 2019, 2020, 20, 2021. We're moving into production now. Um, but if you think about what areas they're tackling, you've got things which are tackling the post-trade post -trade world. So how can I, before I get to moving my assets and cash on chain, how can I get my data on chain and get, get that piece up and running? Then I'll look at moving assets later. And again, that touches on what I mentioned about everyone reading basically off the same books and records. You're already seeing that space develop. The other space is also developing, and you know, I think there's multiple different examples we could point out of bond issuances, which have happened on blockchain. So this is where you know a piece of debt exists as a token, either on a public or private uh, blockchain network, and then you have consumers buying, uh, investors buying those bonds into their digital wallets, uh, and then you know we're seeing some secondary trading in those those areas as well. And that's really where I would say you know product-wise, we've seen the two 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 main areas. The other side, though, is on the cash leg, and you know, cash is key to all you know majority of financial transactions. And you're really seeing the pace pick up from central banks looking at central bank digital currencies, but also on sort of the private side of digital money. You know, there's commercial bank uh, commercial bank coins already out there, and I think that combined with what I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the, the two together are really going to help accelerate progress um, over the coming couple of months. Um, on the reg side, and I think you touched on this uh, at the beginning as well, you know, from the reg perspective, away from CBDCs, you've also got things like Mika, like the EU pilot regime, like the Basel proposal for, for treatment of crypto assets. So again, you know, that's not stuff that happens overnight. It just demonstrates, I think, what Ben mentioned at the beginning, which is whilst on the face of it, it looks like progress has been limited. There's been a lot of work happening in the background, which we're now seeing come to fruition. Um, and really, you know, all of those three components together, together are going to help us accelerate. Uh, accelerate progress this year. 
And the important thing there is, I think, the regulation, right? I think that's, uh, Matt, you have it, I think, partly for you, Jens, as well. We see different speeds and different aspects in focus depending on which regulatory region you sit in. So I sit in an American bank, but actually, if you look at regulation on digital assets, meaning traditional securities, there might be regulatory more opportunity in Europe currently, right? But in the other, on the other side, if you look at um, uh, digital cash, so as you just mentioned, there are another component. Basically, they should be inherently linked together. We see more movement and more leeway if you look at the president's working group and the opportunities that presents itself there. So I think that's why maybe our which points out that we are an evolutionary phase because I think we will have to try and find the best solutions together with a client and as an industry in each field, but we actually need them all in one system because the true benefits don't exist. And I think Amar pointed to it quite, quite nicely. They don't exist on its own island. You will have some benefits and we have to start somewhere, but the true benefits, if we look at that five, 10 year horizon are when everything is in the mix and most of it is digitized, right? We will know that it will take longer for everything, but most of it, it, it it's digitized. And then it, the adaption curve uh, increases exceptionally, ex yeah, ex I exponentially. Think, and I think um, um, to Amar's point, uh, to me, uh, and uh, absolutely echoing what he said on, on the pilot regime and Mika, to me, this is a huge milestone. I mean, going back uh, to 2018, 2019, when we had some front runners, be it Gibraltar, be it Malta, Liechtenstein, and whatnot, now we, now we have kind of, uh, we are about to enter this next phase where we really have a European framework. Yeah, um, um, Mika is in trilogue, um, uh, pilot regime almost um, about to approve. So we really then have the, the, the foundation we were talking about. And um, uh, maybe maybe one thought on, on, uh, on CBDC. To me, sometimes uh, it is on payment solution, it is really uh, too much focused on CBDC because I keep saying in order to facilitate coming back to digital financial markets and digital security services markets, we need a broad spectrum of different of different payment digital payment solutions. This can be uh, uh, high quality stable coins. It can be uh, a digital ways of commercial bank money up to CBDC and, and other payments we might see uh, uh, or we might already have today, like uh, traditional payment routes, be it uh, T2, be it tips and, 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 and up to up to retail payment solution all then linked to uh, to this ecosystem of, of digital financial markets and talking about digital financial markets to me it is the question like what is what is needed in order to tap into what i call the tokenized economy or the digital uh, economy which is you need digitized asset you need digital payment solution you need a, a proper um, a digital identity for entities for individuals up to um, up to devices and then you need um, uh, one or, or many um, um, network, you need proper uh, operators, you need the regulatory frame, and then you are probably there to more or less um, uh, digitize a, a lot of different markets we see today in traditional finance and going uh, above and beyond. When looking at that, being part of an institutional bank, I think the, the solutions to be offered in cash, there's nothing revolutionary in them. It's really the current buckets we already have the collateral, mm -hmm. the commercial bank money. We all use today already, right? There's nothing new around it. And some kind of wholesale CBDC in, in some manner. Um, but I think that that's an important component. I think if you look at payments, the, the, the deeper discussions is coming from access to central bank monies to players who currently don't have access to central bank monies. But in the wholesale space, we do have access to central bank money. We do central bank... Um, money clearing. Uh, so I don't think uh, th that's as revolutionary. And as far as I, I can hear, and when we talk to the industry, we see that this movement of separating those two topics and, and maybe addressing the ones which are easier to address um, is, is, a good way, is a good way forward. And I think it's, it's a, again, a very regulatory and technologically driven driven topic, but together with the industry. And I think yeah. that's important for us. We take the industry and our partners along on that journey. I think that's very important to keep in mind. 
Fantastic. I mean, we've got about five minutes left. So we've talked a lot about the potential for, for, for DLT and where we are today. But ultimately, there is inevitably going to be disruption from something um, this revolutionary. Um, Jens, uh, who do you think, what areas of the market do you think DLT will cause the most disru disruption? Which participants potentially might be disrupted and how will the market evolve? Um, I uh, now the interesting no, answer no, no. comes. <laughs> um, now the, to, to me, disruption is always uh, a, a huge word because everyone believes that disruption happens overnight. I truly, I truly don't believe this. So if you let me, let me first of all spend a minute on on definitions. For me, disruption is um, is a situation where, for example, triggered by technology, the way value is generated in an industry is changing. Huh? Very, very generic. While you have technologies who just do incremental improvements to existing processes and value generation in the industry. Now, talking about DLT and blockchain, to me, this is one of the technologies together with others who have the potential to disrupt, meaning to redefine how value is generated in financial markets. And I truly subscribe to, uh, uh, to, subscribe to this. And in my view, it is uh, as, prob as probably in the past. Um, to me, it's not the question of winners and losers, it's the question of adoption. So um, I think um, market infrastructure as us uh, need to adapt. So we probably need to adapt and into a role of operating not centralized uh, financial market infrastructure, but decentralized market infrastructure in addition. And why do I say in addition? Because I do not believe that overnight existing market infrastructures will disappear. And same is probably true for all the different market participants, be it in issuance, be it in custody, uh, trustee business uh, in in, in, in trading, um, so we see, we will see um, a, an industry which is much more end to end or you uh, Ben keeps saying front to back. So really defining uh, a market markets end to end. So to issue issue from issuers to re, uh, to um, to uh, investors, defining the product end to end from issuance to redemption and defining the, the, the value chain end to end. So from pre issuance uh, then to uh, custody and finally, in my view, and I, I, I want to uh, want to quote something which Thomas Book said in his entry statement: uh, When when markets went electronic, everyone or the market participants they were afraid of of losing business. Yeah, from fraud trading to electronic trading, and it was the same. Markets and market participants had to adapt, and finally we have seen higher liquidity, we have seen tighter spreads, we have seen more products, we have seen higher velocity. And I truly believe that we see the same kind of S-curve in markets again, once market have adapted to um, the possibilities of digital um, securities and digital assets. We see a, 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 a completely new world uh, emerging. And it's for me, it's always a question of uh, uh, grabbing these, um, these, bulls by, these bull by the horns and not um, um, sitting on the on the fence and really letting it happen. So it, for me, it's not a question of being disrupted. It's a question of understanding the technology, understanding the chances, and then adopting to the new to the new world. I, I couldn't agree more. And if you look at innovation in all other fields, it's always the same. You go with your clients, you listen to your clients, you offer innovative solution. And as 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 being Ramelin, we always want to offer choice and and optionality to our clients uh, um, along the way. And as long as you do that, I think there is enough room for winners. And we all have to agree in innovation, there are always people who lose out, but it's normally not one single function or one single role or anything like that, but it's the people who are not innovative or, and I think that's the other thing, nobody will build everything themselves, who do not partner with, with the right partners along that journey. And I think that's for us always the important thing. Uh, the bank is, is very old, we have innovated over and over again and the bank is still there. And I think it's about that innovation, listening to your clients and go on the journey with them, along with the partners in the industry to make that new digital capital market happen to the benefit of all. And I think there is enough role in that as well. I think th the problem, as you said, will be when people do not want to go along that journey or think they can all go on their own. I think this will be that challenge of this new industry, which could generate losers, however you want to call them. But I don't think it's an individual role or individual function. It's people who do not innovate and do not listen to their client and do not go along them and with them on that journny. Good. Thanks, Ben. Um, Amar, we have less than a minute left, but your final thoughts on the on the topic of uh, I was, disruption. I was 
Yeah, I was just going to say, no, I agree with both 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 with the team there. So collaboration, I think this is one area of finance where you're just seeing so much collaboration already. You know, the number of consortiums, working groups that are out there. And it's not just the big players. It's, you know, there's fintechs who have been driving things for the last few years. It's the technology companies running private private blockchain networks. So I think, as, as Ben said, it's the collaboration that's going to be key. Um, but but we're seeing it. We're seeing it all, all, all over the industry. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. That was a great way to start. And uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jens. And thank you, Omar. Thank you.